Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I have the great honor of being here with Dr. Daniel Lieberman. He is the Edwin M. Lerner II Professor of Biological Sciences and Professor of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University. He started his career studying the evolution of the human head, but is now more focused on the evolution of human physical activity and how evolutionary approaches to activities such as walking and running, as well as changes to our body's environments, can help better prevent and treat musculoskeletal diseases. He is the author of books like The Evolution of the Human Head and The Story of the Human Body. So, Dr. Lieberman, as I said, it's a real honor to have you on the show and thank you for accepting the invitation. My pleasure. Okay, great. <laughs> so, I guess that today we're going to focus most of our conversation in the evolution of human bipedalism. So, my first question would be, do we already know concretely what, what were the kinds of evolutionary pressures uh, that gave rise to human bipedalism? I mean, why is it that we evolved e uh, bipedalism? Well, that's still a debate, of course. Um, um, after all, academics aren't paid to agree with each other. We're paid to disagree with each other. That's what science is all about. So uh, if, you, if, you, if you don't have a debate, then you should be suspicious, um, especially when we're talking about the past. But um, there are still different camps out there. But um, I think that... Um, uh, a majority of us uh, um, uh, um, believe that the origins of bipedalism had to do with um, energetic efficiency. The big debate really is about what was the last common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees like. So humans and chimpanzees are more closely related to each other than to other species, than, to, than either of us are to any other species, right? And, but it was long believed that chimps and gorillas were actually more closely related to each other. And that, and that they shared a last common ancestor, and we shared a common ancestor with both of them. When it became obvious from molecular data starting in the 1980s that, that actually humans and chimps are especially similar to each other, that revealed something about very interesting, which is that gorillas and chimpanzees are very similar. Gorillas are basically just kind of big chimpanzees in many ways, morphologically. If you scale up a chimpanzee, like with you know, the bicycle pump, you basically, according to the laws of scaling, you basically get a gorilla. And gorillas also knuckle walk like chimpanzees, which is a very bizarre and unusual form of locomotion. Um, and, and in fact, uh, even gorilla diets are sort of scaled up chimpanzee diets. They're, they're basically, when animals eat lower quality foods, they tend to get bigger bodies so they can have relatively lower metabolic rates. So, so if that's true, unless all the similarities between gorillas and chimpanzees, and there are many, uh, evolved independently, which is statistically impossible, right? Mm -hmm. That means that the last common ancestor of chimpanzees, humans, and gorillas must have looked something like a chimpanzee, because it's unlike it looked like a gorilla, but it meant the same thing. So that means the last common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees probably looked like a chimpanzee, which, which is very important, because it means that when we look at chimpanzees, we're looking at something that's fairly like our last common ancestor. And once we agree on that, and really, there shouldn't be any debate about that, but there are people who debate that, but of course, there are always people who debate everything. But once you agree that the last common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees looked like a chimpanzee and walked like a chimpanzee and climbed like a chimpanzee, then the, most, the next most important fact is that we know from studies that we've done and others have done that chimpanzees are extremely costly locomotors. So when a chimpanzee walks, it spends more than two times as much energy to move its body a given distance for a given mass. It's very, very, very expensive. And that's because it's kind of a compromise between a, a knuckle, you know, a, a walker, a quadrupedal walker and a climber. And, um, and we also know that the time in which chimpanzees and humans diverged sometime around 7 million years ago was a time when Africa was drying out, forests were shrinking. Um, there was more open woodland and even, you know, you know, open habitats available with lower, with less fruit where animals like chimpanzees would have had to walk farther to get their food. Yeah. And, and once you're, you know, evolution is a contingent process, right? You can't just do what you want. You have to, evolution has to deal with the variation that's present, that's, that's selected previously. And once you're a knuckle walker, what are you going to do? You can't go back to being a sort of a typically efficient quadruped. Mm -hmm. looks like the solution was to save energy was to stand up. 
and that would have involved a few changes in the pelvis and the feet, etc. But so, and since humans are basically like other animals, it looks like the solution to the problem of the extraordinary expense of knuckle walking long distances, that the solution that evolution came up with was was to favor those who were who were able to walk bipedally. And 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 add, to add one more fact to that. You know, chimpanzees don't walk very much. The data that we have from people like Richard Wrangham shows that the typical chimpanzee makes walks maybe three or four kilometers a day. That's not very much. Um, but if but a human hunter-gatherer has to walk nine to 15 kilometers a day. If you cost as much as a chimpanzee, you couldn't afford that. Mm -hmm. So I would say that the best evidence so far that we have is, is energy. Mm -hmm. Is energy, but in yeah. that case, it was due to the fact that we had to walk more to obtain food. Correct, yes. Climates were changing. It was just too costly to, to be a, a very inefficient knuckle-walking chimpanzee-like creature. And so selection must have favored some individuals who are better able. You know, chimpanzees do walk upright. You can easily get on YouTube and see videos of chimpanzees walking right. They just don't do it very well. So individuals who had, you know, pelvises that you know, had more flair to them and you know, we're able to not walk with bent hip, bent knee gates, must have had a big advantage, and that's how selection works. You know, if you can save energy on locomotion, what is it? You can, that means you can spend that energy on reproduction. And that's how natural selection works. So it's, it seems like a compelling hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So would you say then that two of the major evolutionary pressures that are behind our the evolution of our bipedalism our climate change and our diets. You got it, absolutely. I would say that is exactly the explanation. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it's very hard to test that, but we do have some fossil evidence. So we have um, the oldest known fossil that belongs to the human lineage is a fossil called Sahelanthropus that I actually worked on. And unfortunately, we don't have much of it. <laughs> we have its head and there might, there might be some other bits of it, but that's all a little bit kind of controversial. But uh, but so far, it looks like it's you know it's a biped from the neck down, from the head, from the neck up. Um, so it looks like it was a biped at least you know so, like about seven million years ago. And then the next closest species is a species called Artipithecus ramidus, which is for which we have a lot of data. That's about 4.4 million years old. And uh, some of us look at that creature and see, well, many of us look and see a biped. <clears throat> I see a creature that looks very much like a chimpanzee that has a lot of adaptations for bipedalism. Um, but not every, you know there are disagreements. I think I think the disagreements are largely driven by um, uh, you know the cart driving the horse in terms of what we want to see in terms of interpreting fossils. But that'll get sorted out. Mm -hmm. Sure. And what is the first hominin that <clears throat> we can be sure was already a biped? I would say that's Sahelanthropus chadensis, about seven million years ago. And the reason we know that is that um, it has a downward-oriented foramen magnum. So animals, humans included and primates included, look where they're going when they're walking. Mm -hmm. And so you know, you, can know, you know the orientation of the head during locomotion uh, if you have a reasonably complete skull. And in Sahelanthropus, instead of the neck pointing backwards like in a chimpanzee, the neck points downwards, the foramen magnum, the hole. Right? So that can only have been the head of a biped. You can't, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your neck is vertical, it means you're a biped. So, so I think that's proof, proof that, um, that it was a biped. Of course, we don't know how it walked, um, um, and that would be really interesting and important to figure that out, but we don't have enough data to answer that question. We do have uh, some hominins later on for which we can make some estimates about how it walked, um, um, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of anatomical changes at the level of the head, for example, came after the acquisition of bipedalism? Well, that's evidence that it was a biped. So, you know, after, during, whatever, I mean, nobody, it's, we don't have enough information to, to, to pinpoint it that exactly. Mm -hmm. And I mean, since diet was an evolutionary pressure for bipedalism, what were the kinds of diets that we had uh, seven million years ago in that case? Well, the chances are, um, I mean, these, these are, you know, there's not, it's hard to figure that out, of course. Um, but we have, uh, if you look at Sal Anthropus, it has very chimpanzee-like dentition. 
So it has chimp. I mean, if you took its chimp incisors, its upper front teeth, and put it in a chimpanzee, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, right? Mm -hmm. um, its molars, its back teeth, are a little bit thicker and larger than you see in a typical chimpanzee, but they're basically, you know, they're kind of intermediate actually between chimpanzees and some later hominins. Uh, its canines are just a little bit smaller. So it looks like it has, from its dentition, a kind of chimpanzee-like diet, but importantly, it looks like a diet, because of the thicker, larger teeth, it looks like it's adapted for more mechanically demanding diets. And remember, natural selection acts on 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 when on not not necessarily on your preferred diet, but on your on your fallback diet, right? So you know things that are you know selection is stronger when the going gets tough, right? So so uh, so it means in all animals, chimpanzees included, have to fall back on on less desirable foods when preferred foods aren't available. In the case of chimpanzees, it's fruits. In the case of most primates, it's fruits. So this is kind of evidence that perhaps these early hominins were having to eat, were selected not, not only to be bipeds, but also selected to eat uh, more mechanically demanding foods, i.e., you know, maybe piths or tubers or, you know, we don't know exactly. Um, and those are just the kinds of foods that you expect you have to eat when the forests fractionate and become less dense. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, since we also hunt, was it the case that hunting also had some kind of selective pressure in how we evolve the ways we walk and run? And well, not initially. I would guess not initially. So chimpanzees do hunt occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, they don't hunt a lot, but, you know, maybe 3-4% of their diet comes from hunting. Uh, and that's primarily from male chimpanzees, not females. Um, but as soon as we became bipeds, we probably lost the ability to hunt for a while because uh, chimpanzees are fast, agile creatures, right? As soon as you become a biped, you lose speed and you lose agility. I mean, that's kind of an obvious statement, right? But you, we only have two legs to power ourselves with rather than four. We're much less stable because our center of mass is higher. So we, had, we paid a price when we, um, when we became bipedal. We became slow and awkward and, 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 um, and you know, less, less, uh, less agile. And uh, that would have really made it much more difficult to hunt. So the kinds of things that you know, chimpanzees, if you ever get on YouTube and watch videos of chimpanzees hunting colobus monkeys, it's extraordinary. I mean, no human acrobat could come close to what a chimpanzee does, um, uh, even the most highly trained human. Uh, we just don't have the ability to do that, um, largely because we're bipedal. So, so once we became bipeds, we probably stopped hunting for quite a long time. And it wasn't until millions and millions of years later, starting around two million years ago, that I think hunting uh, started to get selected for in human evolution. And that's when I think we evolved to be good at running, but not the kind of running that most animals do, which is sprinting, um, which is what chimpanzees do, for example, when they have to. It, we, became, we became the world champion at endurance running, which is very slow, sustained running over very long distances. But then again, that, that happened millions and millions of years after the origins of bipedalism. Mm -hmm. But for endurance running, isn't it the case that we had to acquire other kinds of adaptations, like, for example, sweat sweating and other things like yes, that? Yes, absolutely. So there's a there's a whole suite of features um, that, that we've identified. We wrote a paper in 2004. Dennis Bramble and I wrote a paper in 2004, sort of outlining all the features that you have to evolve, the adaptations, if you will, for endurance running. And um, the interesting thing is that we do, you know, the ones that, preserve a trace in the skeleton, we start seeing them. They all sh start showing up around two million years ago. Sweating, of course, we don't know exactly when that happened because sweat glands haven't yet been preserved in the fossil record, but we don't yet know uh, the genes for sweating, although we're working on that, um, and there's some interesting clues going on. But, um, but certainly in terms of the enlarged gluteus maximus, the elongated Achilles tendon, the, the balance systems in the head, I mean, the list is pretty long. Uh, all of these features start showing up around two million years ago in the genus Homo, and and these are not features that make you better at walking. So we can't we can't come up with any explanation for their selection other than running. Mm -hmm. So it's the case that there isn't any other animal that is uh, as good an, an endurance runner as humans. Well, I mean, you know, it depends over the distance and the speed and all that. But yeah, humans are are, are extraordinary. I mean, humans can r outrun horses, um, you know, which have been selected for by humans to be great runners. Um, um, I, I've done it myself. I've actually run uh, marathons against horses. Um, 
and I'm not a great runner. I mean, I'm an okay runner, but I'm not a you know, I'm not gonna sit, I'm not gonna win any race, right? But I can beat most horses. It turns out. Um, uh, so yeah, humans are extraordinary, uh, 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 especially in the heat um, at running after animals. And we have ethnographic evidence from all over the world. We have data from from Africa, from East Africa, from South Africa, from Australia, from all over the New World, um, from North America, from South America, from Central America. We even have data on how people ran down animals in the winter because, um, you know, the snow it really tires elk and reindeer and things like that. So there, we have data on how people did this everywhere, pretty much all across the planet. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a human capability that, um, that has been exploited and taken advantage, advantage of everywhere we look, actually. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, what were some of the major challenges that bipedalism posed to humans? Because I guess that at least down the line, when we evolved bigger brains, then things like childbirth became harder, correct? Well, before we get to childbirth, let's, okay. let's, let's go to something even simpler, which is the biggest challenge, I think, is, is, is loss of stability and speed. Okay. Uh, which is not a trivial problem. If you're if you're uh, out there in the savanna a few million years ago and a saber-toothed tiger wants to go hunting, you know what's easier to hunt, a gazelle or a hominid, right? <laughs> the hominid, right? Because the gazelle can run twice as fast. I mean, Usain Bolt, the world's fastest runner at the moment, he's retired, but nobody's equal his record yet. You know, he can run mm, at top speed, ten point four meters a second. Mm -hmm. um, I can go out and find all kinds of, you know, sheep who've never been trained, right? Who can run twice as fast, right? Um, uh, both as fast for a human, but not fast for for for, for most, you know, mid-sized quadrupeds. Um, and furthermore, he can only do that for 20, 30 seconds. You know, a gazelle or an impala or whatever can run twice as fast as Bolt for several minutes, right? So. Humans, early hominins would have been easy pickings uh, for any carnivore. So that's a serious challenge. Um, the other problem is stability. Um, four legs are much more stable than two. And so, uh, so there was strong, I would Im imagine that there was also a, a challenges for humans running and not breaking ankles and twisting legs and twisting ankles and all those other problems, which, you know, today, you know, they're a pain in the ass, right? But a few million years ago, it could be a death sentence, right? If you sprained your ankle, um, out there in the in the wild, you're 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 um, you're easy pickings then for all kinds of predators. So so that was the first challenge. But there are other challenges as well. Um, certainly, um, we've sh we've done some work showing that uh, it was a major challenge for pregnant mothers. So you know, if you're a quadruped and you're carrying a, um, a, a quadrupedal mother and you're carrying a fetus, you can you can carry you have much you have much more space to carry that fetus. It's not weighing down on your pelvic diaphragm and you know pelvic floor and interfering with your abdominal organ because you can you can let it distend more. Um, it also doesn't cause you the kinds of back pain problems that pregnant mothers have. So we show that actually we can see by sometime between two and three million years ago we see, see evidence of selection for females to actually resist the 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 the, the, the shearing forces that are caused by having to to to, to um, maintain a really large a fetus. Of course, everybody knows that there are problems um, with birth, um, um, although it's not quite clear when those problems evolved and to what extent those problems are a result of bipedalism. Um, so that's kind of a bit of a debate that's going on right now because, of course, early hominins didn't have brains as large as hominins today. Um, and it's not quite clear why uh, and to what extent um, complications from birth in the past were caused by the head of the fetus being unable to fit through the birth canal. It's a big debate. Because mm -hmm. uh, um, if you can't, you imagine if there's anything strong, I mean, one of the strongest forces of selection would be for mothers to be able to give birth to their infants. Yeah. That's, that's going to be a very, very strong force of selection. And contrary to what some people have argued, there's no, we've found no evidence for a cost having a wider hip. None. So, so, so females don't seem to be constrained in terms of hip width biomechanically. So, we're not sure why um, that's such a tight fit. And one, one hypothesis that's currently being studied by a lot of people is that actually the kind of inability for the fetus to get through the pelvis at the moment is, is actually caused by really high levels of nutrition today that weren't available in the past. We're basically having bigger babies and perhaps smaller pelvises for, for other reasons. 
Um, but there are other other problems with being a biped. Um, lower back pain may be one of them, uh, although that's, again, we don't have a lot of good data on lower back pain in non-Western populations. And, and to what extent, you, you know, you and I get lower back pain because, you know, we just sit around in chairs all day staring into computers is still poorly known. Um, um, yeah, and there's some others as well, but um, but those those would be the I would say the top candidates for 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 the challenges of being a biped. Mm -hmm. And uh, how important was it for us to evolve bipedalism in our evolutionary history? Uh, I mean, if we didn't evolve bipedalism, would we have been able to uh, evolve? Uh, and reach the stage where we are now, I mean, and even evolve other features of our human sociality and our bigger brains and things like that. Well, well nobody knows the answer to that question. <laughs> I mean, it's impossible, right? You, the, the, the experiment's been done only once, and we know what happened, right? Could you evolve the kind of complex social organization and with tool use and and you know hunting and whatever without bipedalism it would have had to happen very very differently than it did in our evolutionary history so uh, you know um, certainly all i can say is that by for, for what we know about what happened in our lineage bipedalism played a very important initial role because remember evolution is a contingent process things that happen later in evolution only hap can happen because of earlier events and bipedalism wasn't didn't evolve, for example, for tool use or tool making, but it sure did uh, free up our hands eventually for tool use and tool making to then occur. Um, so I mean, that was an insight that Darwin um, had back in you know 1871. So um, uh, and it's kind of hard to imagine humans being who we are without without being tool makers and tool users. So and think about all the evolution that's occurred since the invention and evolution of just the simplest stone tools. So I would guess that um, that nothing that happened, or very little of what happened later on, could have happened without bipedalism, but I can't prove that. Mm -hmm. And then there are also things related to the fact that since our ends got freed and we were able to produce tools, some of those tools were used for hunting. And uh, the kinds, uh, the ways by which we hunt, I mean, they depend a lot of, on high levels of cooperation. So it could be the case that down the line, we wouldn't have evolved uh, the, kinds of, the kind of sociality that sure. we have. Yeah, well, I mean, there's more to, more to sociality than hunting, but absolutely, I agree, with, yeah. agree about hunting, but also also gathering and digging. I mean, I mean, female hominids are serious diggers. Um, it's very hard to be a good digger and a primate, right? You know, they don't have natural, so, but we use tools to dig. I mean, they're not very sophisticated tools, but even just a simple stick, you know, used by a biped is quite an extraordinary uh, tool to get access to resources that are not available to a lot of other species. So, so, and that's also a form of cooperation and prosociality and carrying and throwing and who knows what else? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Just in our, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And in our modern societies, we have uh, issues regarding evolutionary mismatch because, for example, we use shoes and we have a lot of physical inactivity. So in what ways do those kinds of things affect our physical health? Well, that's really what my, my book, The Story of the Human Body, is about. It's really about mismatch. And, um, you know, I, I should say that, obviously, I think the mismatch hypothesis is an important hypothesis, but I, I also want to, as a preamble or a, before we go on, you know, I, I also want to acknowledge the fact that mismatch is often kind of used in an simpli overly simplistic way, like the paleo diet, for example, is, a, is an example of overly simplistic use of the mismatch hypothesis. But then, with that caveat notwithstanding, um, you know, at natural selection works on on adapting organisms to particular environmental contexts. And and over millions and millions of years, humans have been adapted to to a wide range of environments. But nonetheless, there are similarities in all those environmental contexts, right? You know, being physically active and you know, eating high fiber diets that are not very processed, and the list goes on. And all of a sudden, in the blink of an eye, because of 
the agricultural revolution and more recently the industrial revolution and now the post-industrial revolution, the how we use our bodies is changing at a, at a breakneck speed. And, and uh, of course, lots of those changes are great, but not all those changes, um, um, uh, the, uh, for not all those changes are bodies adequately or perfectly adapted, right? And, um, and a good example, you know, a simple example is sugar, right? We, we never evolved digestive systems that are capable of coping with high levels of, of, un, of you know, processed foods with lots of sugar. It goes straight to our livers and gives us fatty acid, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It causes obesity. It causes inflammation. It causes you know a wide range of diseases. Um, we're not a, we're not adapted to handling environments that have no pathogens. Um, you know the the hygiene hypothesis is, or the old friends hypothesis, essentially uh, posits that, and I think it's, I think it's a very solid hypothesis that you know our our immune systems evolved to be under constant threat. And now we remove all that threat from our in our environment and all of a sudden we still have the same immune system, right? It's, and now it doesn't have anything to do anymore and it's more likely, put simply, to get into trouble and attack ourselves. So we get allergies, we get autoimmune diseases. Um, uh, these are consequences of a mismatch. Um, um, Physical inactivity is another one. We we never evolved not to be physically active. And sure, you can live to be you know ripe old age by being physically inactive. Look at look at Donald Trump, who's a you know a completely physically inactive, overweight uh, you know person. Um, but you can bet your bottom dollar that the, one of the reasons he's still alive is he's on all kinds of drugs and you know he's getting medical care that's enabling him to to cope with his 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 very poor lifestyle choices. Right. So uh, we all suffer as a result. So. Uh, uh, so, so, you know, you can we can cope with mismatches to some extent, but um, but 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 the mismatches are still there. Mm -hmm. But so the real big mismatches started with the agricultural revolution. Was that it? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, look, mismatch is a part of selection. So mismatches always occur, right? When organisms. Um, you know, disperse into new environments or environmental change that causes mismatches, but the selection apps act, acts on it. And so, 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 you know, mismatch is not special to humans, but humans, because of culture, we're really good at creating mismatches. And probably the first big, you know, uh, you know, storm of mismatch was the industrial revolution. It was the agricultural revolution. We changed our diets so that we ate you know, high, high, high cereal diets, high carb diets that were kind of lower in nutrition. But even more importantly, we, we started living with animals. We got a wide range of infectious diseases from animals. Uh, some of the most scary diseases on the planet today, like smallpox, et cetera, came from, from living with animals. Um, and also um, uh, all kinds of diseases that come from being in high population densities and being sedentary and not moving. So you basically we live in our own filth, essentially, and so we get all kinds of digestive and you know infectious diseases from from um, from from high population densities and lack of mobility. So um, so yes, so the agricultural revolution we see uh, just a rapid increase in all kinds of new diseases. Um, we also see um, malnutrition, um, and um, and so you know not long after the first farming farming uh, evolved. People get shorter, you know, because they have less energy, and and their lifespan declined rapidly. Uh, so, you know, infant, infant and mortality rates went up, and but also lo longevity declined. Um, and it really wasn't until, um, you know, with the advent of modern medicine and and sanitation, um, that we actually saw a reversal of those trends. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I mean, our diets really changed a lot. They they went from being basically mostly on on what on what we hunted and what we gathered to uh, a diet based on cereal. Correct, or rice, or you know, depending on what part of the world you lived, corn, rice, etc. And those diets aren't necessarily terribly unhealthy, um, but they're not, um, um, you know, but they can be unhealthy, um, particularly um, in the sense that they're less nutritious. Um, uh, there, there, there's more calories, you know, and calories in, babies out is the equation, right? But, but when you have, but when, but you also have um, more protein malnutrition, um, fewer vitamins. Uh, so there were, you know, goiters and 
thyroid conditions and all kinds of other things may have also come as a byproduct of agricultural revolution. But but let's be let's be clear, you know, farmers' diets are way more healthy than a lot of modern post-industrial diets. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, when we adopted agriculture, I guess that also one of the things that occurred was that there was sort of a trade-off between a more nutritious diet that we had when we were hunter-gatherers, uh, uh, between that and maybe uh, higher human population densities because we are, were able to really increase uh, hugely the numbers of people in the different societies. Absolutely, yeah. So despite all the risks of farming, you know, famines and, and, and all the bad stuff that came along with farming, farmers can produce way more calories than hunter-gatherers. And so they can start pumping out babies at a faster rate and the end result is population growth, um, but the but the cost was 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 uh, lower levels of overall health. Mm -hmm. Lower levels of overall health, but maybe another advantage of doing that was that uh, since we have more people, probably cultural evolution accelerated. Oh, no question about it. Yeah, I mean, more people. Uh, you also begin to have the accumulation of wealth yeah. uh, so you can have specialization I mean you can you can have you can have you know artists and you know yeah. and also bad things too like soldiers and you know I mean all kinds of all, all kinds of things happen you know uh, once you had agriculture it's, uh, it's no question about it mm -hmm. there was also the rise of inequality I guess and societies Absolutely. The, the hierarchies were more fixed. Sure. Yeah. So. yeah. I mean, this is a, 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 an unquestionable consequence of, of agriculture and farming. Absolutely. The, the rise of complex societies that could, that, that, that have, they have good things and also some bad things. Yeah, sure. And I mean, when it comes to evolutionary mismatch, what are some of the solutions that we think that you think we could adopt to solve that kind of problem, particularly when it comes to health problems? So, so in uh, in my book, the story of the human body, I, I outline a, a kind of a, a hypothesis of what I call disevolution. So, disevolution is caused by when we treat the symptoms rather than the causes of of mismatched diseases. So let's take a very simple example, myopia, right? So myopia is caused, is a very, is very used, used to be very rare. So if we go to hunter-gatherer populations or, or, or elders in, in, in you know, uh, pre-industrial populations, almost none of them have myopia. But their grandchildren and sort of populations that spend a lot of time indoors and um, aren't getting, you know, get the kind of complex visual stimulus when they're young are much more likely to become myopic. So, you know, okay, myopia is not a, not a good thing, but, um, but we have glasses, right? So we go to the ophthalmologist and get, get prescription glasses or whatever, and we can cope with it. And, you know, that's fine. And so we do nothing. As a result, nobody's telling their children, you know, don't read, don't go to school, so you don't get myopic, right? We're willing to put up with the cost of myopia and just give our kids glasses. So that's a kind of disevolution, but it's not... It's not too disturbing, right? Nobody gets upset about glasses, right? But um, but there are other forms of disevolution which are disturbing, right? Like um, you know, diabetes and cancer and flat feet and and the like. And and we you know we do very little to prevent those diseases. Um, if I you know, the chances are that very few of us think about how to prevent cancer. We just hope we don't get it, and when we do get it, we go to a doctor and have, hope the doctor will, will treat it. Heart disease is another one, right? High blood pressure, you know, uh, heart disease is the number one killer of people in, in the world today. But we know that people who, you know, a lot of heart disease, we just know from all kinds of data is, is preventable. Um, but we, you know, we take statins and, you know, we do what Donald Trump does. We take statins, we get heart bypasses and we do all those sorts of things. Um, and, you know, we kind of get by, right? You know, that takes a cost, but, um, 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 but that's, to me, that's disevolution. That's treating the symptoms of the problems rather than preventing their causes. And, and, and by taking an evolutionary perspective, I think we can look um, more, more clearly at the causes of these mismatched diseases and do more to prevent them. 
from simple things like maybe the shoes that we're wearing are, are not promoting healthy, strong feet, so we have weak feet because of the shoes that we wear. Maybe we could wear shoes that um, help promote foot strength. Um, we certainly could promote uh, uh, more exercise and physical activity that would, that, would have, that would yield enormous dividends for people's health around the planet. Um, um, you know, processed foods that are high in, in, in sugar and low in fiber and you know, high in saturated fat, etc. You know, these are things that we can do something about. We just lack the political will, right? Look, think, you know, look at, at the effort to try to put taxes on sugar. Most countries, um, you know, public health officials in every country on the planet are calling for sugar taxes, but, you know, rich corporations are preventing that from occurring. Also, because probably it involves a lot of money, right? Exactly. It's money, right? And, you know, these companies are giving us what we want to some extent. We all like, I mean, I like sugary things. I mean, I'm not a freak. I love sweet stuff. Um, I am, um, you know, when I see an elevator, I want to take the elevator too. Um, um, but these things aren't necessarily good for us. And, and we have to, we now have to make choices that we never used to have to make before, right? Nobody had to choose whether or not to eat the chocolate cake in front of them in the past, right? Nobody had to choose whether they were going to take the stairs or the escalator. There, were, there was no escalators, right? Um, now we're asking people to make choices, and those choices are abnormal. I mean, you know, um, if you put escalators in the Kalahari Desert or, you know, other parts of the world, the hunter-gatherers there would take them, for sure. I mean, um, save energy. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and that's also another problem because even these kinds of foods that we like and the fact that uh, if we can, we are physically inactive. Um, I mean, it makes sense from an evolutionary perspective in the sense that those kinds of foods are more caloric and physical inactivity save, uh, saves energy. Of course. I mean, we're, people are just doing what we evolved to do. I mean, they're, they're following natural instincts. And you have to override those instincts. That's not easy. Mm -hmm. But in this case, since we are exposed to these completely novel environments, uh, I mean, I, I, I guess that this is controversial, but maybe one of the solutions would be to let natural selection sort the problem out. Because, I mean, <laughs> if it was the case that we didn't have access to, for example, uh, our elf systems, uh, may, may, maybe over time people would become adapted well, to these so sorts I'm, of lifestyles. Uh, that's unlikely, and the reason, and here's why. First of all, in addition to being a little unethical, but, um, yeah, uh, sure. it, but, but the reason that it won't happen is that most of these diseases don't occur until we, after we reproductively you know, finished, right? Mm -hmm. and people don't get heart disease and cancers and and plantar fasciitis and you know the list goes on most of these diseases don't occur in people until they're in their grandparents um, and and unlike the past where grandparents used to you know go out and hunt and gather for their grandchildren today grandparents just use up their you know grandchildren's inheritance um, on medical bills so there's no real you know so so so, so selections not going to act on on these 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 diseases very strongly because they they don't affect reproductive success very much so um, so they're, they're what we call uh, in the selective shadow um, of, of a term of Sir Peter Medawar it's um, so so selection is unlikely to solve this problem even if uh, even if we were to let it take its course mm -hmm. and uh, through some sort of biomedical approach like for example even genetic engineering do you think that we could solve the problem that way well, maybe we'll have to, but I find that a very depressing thought because, you know, for, well, as long as science has been around, we have sort of technologists telling us that they're going to come up with all these solutions to, to our problems um, uh, so that we can go ahead and do all the bad things that we're doing um, in order to, you know, live by it. I mean, you know, grow new organs and, and, and you know, there's always some new hope for cancer and, um, and so on. Well, maybe, but you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna gamble on that. I'm not gonna wait around for it. We actually know how to prevent a lot of these diseases, um, and the sad fact of the matter is, we don't trust each other or ourselves to do it. And um, look, if you have a, a preventive solution available versus the the hope of a, of a of a of a of a of a treatment solution potentially in the future, 
we still way overvalue that, that the kind of hope of the potential solution in the future than the actual available, currently available preventive solution. Um, if you just exercise 150 minutes a week, you decrease your relative risk of death in a given year by about 50%. I mean, that's 21 minutes a day. It's nothing, right? And yet only 20% of my fellow Americans can be bothered to exercise for 21 minutes a day. It's, you know, and, 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 and it's, you know, part of that's our fault, but part of that's because we're constantly told, ah, don't worry about it, you know, your doctor will take care of it, and, you know, when you get the disease. Um, but, we but, but, we but, spend but, less than 5%, maybe 3% of our, our entire medical budget, right, which is a third of our gross national product on prevention. We spend less than, you know, a tiny fraction on prevention, and yet 75% of diseases that Americans get are preventable, according to the CDC. And medical care affects about 10% of the outcome. So we're spending a third of our economy to, to try to treat diseases, almost all of which are preventable, and getting almost nothing from it. And it's completely stupid. Um, yet we, all it takes is just a little bit of simple prevention, and we would transform our lives and our economy. And these 21 minutes a day of exercise that you were talking about, what kind, what kind of activity? Any moderate, any moderate physical activity that gets your heart rate up, you know, climbing the stairs, uh, a rapid walk, uh, you know, a, a, mod, a moderate jog. We're not talking about like training for the Tour de France or running a marathon. We're talking about just simple physical activity. Um, um, there's studies which show that, 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 just basic levels of physical activity can reduce a woman's chances of breast cancer between 30 and 50 percent. 30 and 50 percent. Many doctors don't even know that. Um, and yet, um, and many, many women don't know that. Um, if you could be told that you could reduce your chances of breast cancer by a third to a, to a half, would you do it? I would if I, if I were a woman. Um, you can reduce co risk of colon cancer by 60 percent. The only known effective way to, to prevent Alzheimer's, right? It's physical activity. Nothing else works. All those silly games, you know, the mind, you know, solving puzzles, etc. I mean, there's no evidence that any of them have any benefit in terms of preventing dementia. Um, uh, but we do know, and we actually even know a fair amount about some of the mechanisms by which physical activity prevents dementia um, uh, and, and Alzheimer's. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, you know, it's not a magic pill. It doesn't prevent everything. It reduces your risk. But it's, um, this is, you know, this is a, this is not, um, this, this is available knowledge, you know, not, not some promise of a future, future solution. Mm -hmm. And in terms of physical activity, I mean, we've been talking about the impact that it has on diseases like obesity and cancer, and even some cerebral conditions, let's say, and in terms of the mus musculoskeletal system, I mean, uh, how important it is for us to, ke uh, to keep <laughs> Huge, it? huge. I mean, uh, you know, one of the biggest problems in of morbidity, you know, in, in old age is, is what's called sarcopenia, when you lose muscle strength. So older individuals can't get out of bed or have a hard time getting out of chairs and they can't do chores and and because um, they lose power. Um, sarcopenia is caused by inactivity and has and has negative feedback effects because it means then you become very slow at walking and you don't get much physical activity you can't get your heart rate up and that causes hypertension which causes atherosclerosis which causes strokes which causes you know I mean you know physical inactivity is a web of interactions um, that, uh, that often start with the musculoskeletal system there's osteo osteoporosis so physical activity helps slow the rate of bone loss um, it um, Physical activity appears to be preventive in terms of osteoarthritis um, uh, in many cases. So it helps prevent uh, people from getting, you know, painful osteoarthritis, which prevents them from being physically active. Um, so, so musculoskeletal diseases are one of many diseases, set of diseases, which are, are for which physical activity is highly protective and which have enormous effects on people's quality of life, their longevity, um, their, you know, their health. It's, um, it's, uh, it's. It, there's compelling evidence. It's again, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a magic bullet. It won't prevent all problems, sure. and you know you can. There are trade-offs. Like if you if you if you you know you can injure yourself from physical activity too, and uh, if you 
if you like, tear your ACL or have a meniscal tear, you increase your risk of osteoarthritis. So they're complex trade-offs. So it's not, you know, let's not pretend that it's it's a simple band-aid solution for everything. But it, uh, on the whole, the benefits totally outweigh the cost. Mm -hmm. So in in hunter-gatherer societies, for example, the rates of these kinds of disease are much lower. As far as we can tell, absolutely, yeah, and, and also in even subsistence farmers. I mean, sure, they, you know, we don't have as good quality data from those societies because there's not, you know, you know, not modern hospitals with people diagnosing these diseases and CT scanners and all that sort of stuff. But as far as we can tell, um, you know, based on some simple measurements like blood pressure, as well as you know, studies of skeletons, etc. Uh, we just published a paper showing that the rate the age-specific rate of arthritis in the knee, mm -hmm. right? So if you're a 70 year old today, you are more than twice as likely to have arthritis in your knee than a 70 year old with the same body mass of the same sex from the same ethnicity who was born before World War II. We've that, rates have doubled since World War II after you correct for body mass, sex, and ethnicity. Now, that's not because of any genetic change, right? <laughs> that's clearly an environmental change, right? And, and, um, and what's changed in those years? Well, there's more obesity, but again, we're correcting here for body mass. So, so physical activity seems to be uh, the culprit. Mm -hmm. couldn't, it, uh, couldn't there be a confounding factor there because of the fact that our life expectancies have increased? No, that's, no, that's for, I said for a given age. So a 70 year old oh, today, yeah, yeah. a 70 year old before. And furthermore, life expectancies, yes, they have increased since the farming era. But if you go back to hunter gatherers, not much. So if you've survived child, you know, life expectancy is a very dangerous variable, right? Uh, parameter, because life expectancy includes childhood mortality. So hunter gatherers have very high childhood mortality rates. So 40%, maybe 50%. Hunter gatherer kids don't make it. Um, the first few years, but if a kid makes it through the first three or four years of life, hunter-gatherers are likely to live between 68 and 78, which is not far off from most of the world today. So, so, um, so life expectancy after you correct for infant mortality today is only a little bit higher than it was in the Paleolithic. Mm -hmm. Well, th that's interesting. So, I, I mean, if we take the infant mortal uh, the infant mortality bit out of the picture, then could we say that our normal expected life expectancy, let's say, would be around the same that it is today in modern societies? Close. It's, well, it's a little higher today, but you know, you could expect to live seven decades if you were a hunter-gatherer, if you made it through childhood. Um, today, I think in the United States, life expectancy is 76 to 81 for, for, for men and women. So, yeah, we're a little bit higher, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's very interesting because when we think about hunter-gatherers and the period before the Neolithic, uh, I mean, people usually say that we had a life expectancy of around 30 years of age, but uh, I mean, pu putting aside the infant mortality bit, then perhaps we get a different picture of... Unquestionably. The... Unquestionably different picture. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, let me just ask you one last question. Since we are talking about evolutionary mismatch and the kinds of environments we live today, um, wouldn't it be a good solution to solve these issues, uh, trying to change the environments we live in? in for example, changing the kinds of food products that we have at our disposal and maybe the way we structure our buildings to make us walk or run a little bit more and things like that. Oh, absolutely. The problem is that, but that's a political problem, not a... So that's a question of, of, of motivation and politics. I mean, here's a simple example. We don't have much physical education in schools anymore. And that's true in Europe as well as the United States. Kids just aren't getting as much you know, time outside to play and run around. And, um, and that, that's creating a toll on, 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 on those kids' bodies and their future health. Um, why is that occurring? Because of school systems are cutting back on costs and there are more tests and 
you know, all those other reasons. But we are we're making choices um, often out of ignorance, um, and um, we need to have um, we need to rethink the kinds of choices that we're making because we pay a big price. Uh, I mean, look. Even in Europe, where, where medical care costs are much lower than the United States, you're still paying a lot of money for medical care. Um, uh, and it's, it's very expensive. We could reduce the cost of medical care. I mean, I'm not talking about suffering <laughs> and longevity, which are also important. I'm just talking from a purely economic standpoint, right? I mean, uh, you know, we could save a lot of money um, by, um, by promoting more health. Um, and that includes, you know, better choices for food in schools. Now, the question is, how do we balance that with people's rights? You know, people have the right to smoke. People have the right to eat chocolate cake. People have the right to, you know, do all those things that to our bodies that are not necessarily um, healthy. But many of us want to do the right thing. We just struggle to do it. So most of us want help to make the choices that we would like to make. And so that's what social contracts are for, right? And so we need to figure out how we're going to help each other and and. Um, and that means we need help from deceptive advertising. You know, there are products that are marketed as healthy, which are not healthy. We need we need help making you know um, uh, you know nudging us to take the stairs instead of the escalator. We we need help, and that's going to come. That's going to that that's going to require political action. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was also referring to changing our environments because I guess that. Uh, people willingly and effortfully changing their behavior. I mean, it's much more difficult than simply restructuring uh, what is around them. Correct. Yeah. People, I mean, we're making choices because we're given choices. Um, if I, if I, when I go shopping, I try to go shopping after I've had a meal. So I'm not craving food. So then, then I don't buy the foods that I'm going to crave, uh, you know. You know. So, so last night when I, you know, wanted wanted something sweet, you know, the we, only reason I didn't eat anything really sweet is that I didn't have anything sweet in the house, because I had. Yeah. But if I had gone shopping right after going for a run, I probably would have, you know, bought that cake. Right. So, um, so you know, we we have to figure out how to how to nudge ourselves. We also have to help, you know, figure out how to get social institutions to help nudge us too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Lieberman, let's end the interview here. Before we go, what are the best places on the internet for people to find your work? <laughs> I don't know. Um, um, uh, I have a website with, with a lot of my papers available uh, as PDFs. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of YouTube videos of me giving various lectures here and there. So. Uh, um, they're not too hard to find, so um, should be able to find those. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will be leaving links to your work in the description box of the interview so that people can go and check it out. Uh, and it was, again, a real pleasure to have you on the show and to talk to you, so thank you for taking the time. My pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. Right, Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been doing regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep this channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even just one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, you can also support me via Subscribestar or Paypal. And please share the video, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gilinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Janne Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, John Connors, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Dr. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervois, and Bo Weingart. And also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.